We are going to talk today about Rick Warren. And the reason we're going to talk about Rick Warren, by the way, I, su I support the work that the dissenter is doing here. I actually subscribed to them and, and paid to have a, uh, so I could bring you the truth of different articles and apostasy and things that are going on. I was going to talk about feminism, and I will touch it just a little bit probably. But really what I want to do is I've never really had a really good warning um, about, about uh, Rick Warren and really dealing with who Rick Warren is. And Rick Warren makes a lot of statements in this video. He's appearing before the Southern Baptist Convention. And as he's appearing before the Southern Baptist Convention, he's concerned that he's going to get kicked out. I don't think he's that concerned. But anyway, he's concerned that uh, he's going he's gonna to be kicked out of the Southern Baptist Convention because he ordained three women. Well, now, I don't believe in having a convention like that. And there are a lot of apostates in the Southern Baptist Convention. Rick Warren being one of the main apostates in the Southern Baptist Convention. But there's, there's a lot of woker gay people, uh, sodomite, transgender type, uh, abortion supporting people in the transgender movement and in, in the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, so anyway, they, they are there and they are supporting that movement. Now, uh, Rick Warren is going to talk about some things here and he's going to kind of skirt the issue. He's going to try to get around, but, and he talks about how his great grandfather was led to Christ by Charles Spurgeon. Now I have to admit to you, that's pretty cool. I, and he was sent to America by Spurgeon. I, I do think that's pretty cool. I mean, on a side note, I, that's pretty neat. Uh, all right. That, 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 that Rick Warren is no reflection of Charles Spurgeon, but it's just kind of neat that that's what happened, that, that he, that his grandfather was. It's a shame that he has shamed his great grandfather by doing what he has done. That's a shame. Because I guarantee you, his great grandfather would not have supported what Rick Warren is doing and how Rick Warren built churches. But Rick Warren's going to brag and he's going to tell you all the churches that he supported or that, that he's started and the pastors that he's trained. And then I want you to consider how absolutely horrific the country is today, the world is, and these people that are called SBC pastors, Southern Baptist Convention pastors, that, that are all over the country and all over the world preaching Rick Warren's garbage. And then I'm going to show you how Rick Warren built churches. I'm going to go to uh, a good archive that David Cloud has concerning Rick Warren, and I'm going to show you the archive of Rick Warren and how he actually built churches. Because it matters what you build them on. Are they built on Christ? Are they built on truth? No. They're built on an antichrist doctrine. Uh, he's going to talk about how he's friends with Jesuit coadjutor dead Jesuit coadjutor Billy Graham. Uh, let me go to my YouTube page. And let's go to the Your Channel portion. Let's see. Let me find popular downloads that make people very angry. One of those is Stephen Hawking. Boy, that made some people mad. But here's one right here. Because he's going to talk about he's going to talk about Billy Graham. He's going to talk about how Billy Graham trained him, how Billy Graham picked him up as an eighteen-year-old skinny boy and trained him. Now, why is that important? It's very important because it's very important because um, Rick Warren follows the same ecumenical mess that Billy Goat Graham did. Um, and the dangerous, theological, practical, biblical shifts from the truth and from proper practice that we find in the New Testament. See, in order to follow the changes that these people have made, 
I want to show you what you have to do. You have to believe in a progressive, evolutionary, scriptural hermeneutic, you should say. I could, I would, I could say. That's what you would have to believe in. Because you do not believe in what Jude talks about. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares, crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men. They are ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. So he's talking about, he's talking about those that left the faith, they creep in, they go out with us as if they, they, they are among us and they act like they're with us, but then they go out from us and they die in the wilderness and they die in the wilderness because they're really not of us, as John said. Because they no doubt would have continued with us. They left Israel, they left with Israel when they went out of Egypt, but they died in the wilderness. They died in unbelief. Why? Because they were not true believers. True believers endure. True believers have patient endurance. True believers don't stop believing. They believe the truth. I believe, if you ask me, Pastor, what do you believe? I believe in the preservation of the saint, that he is preserved by God. And I also believe in the perseverance of the saint. I believe both. And I believe we persevere. We continue on for the Lord. We endure afflictions as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We continue on in the faith once delivered unto the saints by the preservation of the Holy Spirit. I do not believe God saves his people and then leaves them in a damnable state to walk away from him. I do not believe that. I do not believe that's even accurate. So I believe in both. I believe in the preservation and the perseverance of the Lord's saints. I hope you do too. I think it's pretty easy to prove both of those things. And I believe it all hinges on the Holy Ghost of God. It all hinges on, on the regeneration it all hinges on the sealing of the Holy Ghost, whereby you're sealed under the day of redemption. It all hinges on Christ. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the author of it, and he is the finisher of it. Faith is finished when sight comes in. Watch this. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Do you see that? The greatest of these is charity. That love, you don't need faith in heaven. Why? You have sight in heaven. You have Christ in heaven. But you will always have charity in heaven. Here we walk by faith, not by sight. There our faith is perfected. It's no more needed. Jesus is the author and the finisher. He is the author of it. He is the refiner of it. 
He is the finisher and the completer of it. And it will be completed. It will be, it will be completed that good work shall be performed until the day of Christ, right? When we stand before God and we no longer need faith because the Son of God, the Lamb, is the light thereof. And we will no longer need it, but charity will always be there. Love, because it comes from God, just like faith does. But faith is only necessary on this side. It won't be necessary in heaven any longer, because we'll be perfect. We'll be like Christ. We won't need it. All of our trials will be over. The sin nature eradicated. It'll be gone in heaven. It's not gone now, as many of you understand. All of you should understand. So, we do believe in both of those things. Now, what is Rick Warren? He is changing. The Bible warns us of men like Rick Warren. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. This is them. This is these false prophets that shall arise, speaking perverse things. Paul warned of these men in Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Boy, have I dealt with those wolves. And they call themselves, you know, uh, vampires, and they... They say that there's vampires and werewolves. Well, I happen to believe that person was a werewolf. So, I everything looks fine here. I don't see any problems with the stream. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver, gold, or apparel. Yea, your own selves know that these hands administered. So Paul is talking about, as an apostle, how he cared for them. He, and then he, later he talks about how... Um, how uh, he provided for other churches himself. Paul had a vast network of people. He also worked with his own hands when he had to, which I did the first five years of my ministry here. Um, as a pastor, I worked full-time and pastored full-time. There's no such thing as pastoring part-time. It just doesn't happen. But uh, anyway, uh, but now... And we may, I may show you part of that video of Rick Warren or of Billy Graham when he talks about that. I might skip over there and show you that. Well, let's get in here to say now Rick Warren is trying to defend himself. He goes on to say, I'm not going to defend myself, but he does defend himself. And when he does defend himself, none of it is with Bible, none of it is biblical. It is a twisting of scripture completely. Because that's what he does best. He twists scripture. So anyway, we're going to hear it, and then you're going to understand why this wolf is so dangerous. He is an absolute wolf. He is an absolute phony. And he acts, he claims credentials that that and, and name drops so he can continue to deceive people when he doesn't hold to anything near what Spurgeon held to. He doesn't hold to anything near what uh, any of those men held to, besides what Billy Graham held to, which is nothing good. A different Jesus, which I'll show you. Billy Graham sent him back to the Jewish synagogue, and he promised them, because he was a Jesuit coadjutor, he promised them. Billy Graham has a degree. Don't get me started on Billy. Let me just start playing this. 
You know, um, first, everybody welcome to Orange County, Southern Baptist of 149 Southern Baptist churches here, 90 of them started by Saddleback Church. So he, he, he throws that plug in there. 90 of those churches started by Saddleback Church. You know, that would be a wonderful thing if those were biblical churches founded on the scriptures and not founded on Rick Warren's philosophies. You know why he built those churches? Because he didn't take a stand for the scriptures. It's not hard to build. Listen, if I, by, if I wanted to be a little apostate, I could build up a hundred, I guarantee you, a hundred fake little rock and roller devilish churches if I wasn't a Christian, if I wasn't a saved, born again man called by God to do the work of the ministry and Holy Ghost led, I could do the same thing. It's not that hard. It isn't that hard just to give people what they want. It's really easy to give people what they want. You know what's hard to do? Tell them the truth. You know what's difficult to do? Take a stand for what's right. Not go along to get along. Not some purpose-driven drivel. But his churches, what are they built on? Well, we're going to show you what they're built on. Then you tell me why that guy hasn't been kicked out of that convention long ago. You know, it's customary um, for a, a guy who's about to be hung to let him say his dying words. <laughs> I have no intention of defending myself. I have taught my kids and grandkids for years. I am most like Christ when I refuse to defend myself. Okay, now, that's duplicious, okay? First of all, he is going to defend himself. Second of all, there's no defense for his doctrine, his false doctrine. There's no defense for him laying hands on a woman and putting them into the pastoral ministry. There is no defense for that. So I wouldn't expect you to defend that. What are you going to defend it with? Oh, I know. You're going to defend it with the woke, gay, transgender, effeminate, wimpy, babyish, Jezebel technique like you're doing right now. Making people laugh getting all folksy and then getting a little preachy so you could act like you actually stand for something real. The Bible says Jesus spoke not a word unto them. By the way, Jesus spoke. There is a time sometimes where you walk away from your enemies and you don't answer them. I'll give you an example. Five years ago, there was a lot of people that tried to butt into old past Baptist churches. I had passed our, our ministry and our are issues of discipline, right? And a lot of them tried to butt in to things that were not their business, right? Well, did I owe them a response? No, it's none of their business. It's not a doctrinal issue. You're not charging me with some doctrinal impurities. You're not saying that I'm an apostate, or you're not proving that I'm an apostate. You don't like some decisions that were made here. Big deal. It's none of your business. It's not your church. There's a group of men here that, that if there's church business to conduct, if there's church business to deal with, we deal with it in-house. It's not up for vote. It's not up for vote of the, of the YouTube assembly. It's not up for vote online. It's none of your business. But if it's apostasy, if it's Pastor Cooley's holding to um, damnable heresies, and they write me, then I'm going to defend it. And I'm going to say, no, that's not true. I don't hold to those things. Here's what I believe. I'm going to defend my stand doctrinally. I have no problem doing that. But if you, so Jesus didn't open his mouth because he was, came to die. That was his purpose was to die. Paul spoke for himself. Acts chapter 22, I'm going to talk tonight about that. Right? I, I'm going to tell them tonight in Acts chapter 22 what, that Paul defends himself. Paul speaks. So there is a time to defend yourself when it comes to that. Here, doctrinally, him being wrong and in heresy and error, 
Yeah, he should answer for it. Them when Pilate accused him of all kinds of things. So I have no intention. Uh, I have most of you on my mailing list anyway, and I can write you and tell you what I believe about the gift of pastoring as opposite from the office of pastoring. But I'm not here to talk about that. Okay, so notice the little stinky, Jesuit, nasty, pukey, disgusting, slithering, snaky, devilish way he said that. Mm -hmm. The gift of a pastor is for the office of a bishop. That's what it's for. By the way, no woman was ordained in the Bible. Jesus did not lay hands on any woman. The apostles did not lay hands on any woman. The apostle Paul did not instruct Timothy to lay hands on any woman. Nowhere in the scriptures is there found a woman that was biblically ordained and hands laid on her for the ministry. Nowhere. You have as much evidence for that as you do for babies being baptized. He is just a liar, a deceiver, and a fake. The Southern Baptist Convention is debating what, a pa what the office of a pastor is. They don't even know it. Really? Why? Because some influential man that makes millions of dollars for the convention? Right? Wants to do that? This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife. Okay? Having his, right? No striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that rules well. His own house. Having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil. Well, that's pretty. Seeing how women aren't supposed to even speak in the assembly? Okay, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. What came the word of God out from you, or came it you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Pretty clear, isn't it? He says in another place. First Timothy 2 12. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. 
For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. That lunchtime, I wrote you a love letter, and I'd like for my possibly, likely last convention to read it to you. Kay and I... By the way, he is such, such a manipulator. Such a manipulator. Could have not built Saddleback Church to its size and influence in any other denomination. I love Southern Baptist. I am a fourth generation Southern Baptist pastor. My great grandfather was led to Christ by Charles Spurgeon and sent to America as a church planter. Saddleback was sponsored by the North American Mission Board. I served on the staff of the California State Convention and the Texas State Convention as a teenager. Billy Graham picked me up when I was 18 and for the next 52 years mentored me because I started at 16 years old, hired by the California Convention to preach youth revivals, and I had and preached, I had preached over, 100 over 120 uh, harvest crusades before I was 20. Billy took this long-haired, skinny Californian and mentored me for the next 52 years. Okay, well, Billy did. Oh, well, who's Billy? Well, good morning. Ready to make some friends and influence some people here with this video. Um, this probably, you know, when I do videos like this about rock stars and other people like that, people get really ticked. They get pretty angry. So, um, I'm just going to talk about this here and, uh, Billy Graham. Well, Billy Graham, uh, was a Jesuit coadjutor. He had a degree from a Jesuit university. I know, never mind. Don't worry about the facts, preacher. Just talk about how good he was and how kind he was and how soft he was and how squishy he was like Charmin. Well, you know what? That's how false prophets are. They're very soft and squishy. And, um, you know, lovable fuzzballs, I guess. But here's the thing, okay? Billy Graham. Billy Graham was working with the Pope. He was working. He had an audience with the Pope. He went to go see the Pope. He met with the Pope. He kissed the pinky finger of the Pope. I mean, you don't get any more Jesuity than that. That's kind of a funny word, I know. But anyway, you don't get that. He was working. Yeah, and he was a Mason, I believe. But, but you know, I mean, the guy had a degree from a Jesuit university. His handler was Bishop Fulton Sheen. He met him on a train. He was like best friends with him. They were like best friends. And I did a whole video on this. It's called Prophets of the New Age Church, and Billy Graham is on it, okay? And it's all about Billy Graham. You can go back and listen to it, uh, YouTube it, or go to sermonaudio.com slash Pastor Cooley, and you can read about it there, or you can listen to the sermon there. Covered it all. I have all the information there about it. Uh, Billy Graham, his organization sent people back um, to apostate churches. He, got, he actually got on... Uh, uh, let's see, Schuler, Robert Schuler, his his uh, program, and at the Crystal Cathedral, and he said, and Billy said, I think there's many ways to bring people to the body of Christ and all this other weird stuff, and and he said, I'm so glad to hear you say that, Billy. I'm so glad to hear you say that. There's a wideness to God's mercy. There's a wideness to God's mercy. No, actually, there's the narrow road. It's called the narrow way, right? That's what the Bible says. It's a narrow way. There's a wideness to God's mercy, Billy. I'm so glad to hear you say that. This is the same guy. By the way, Robert Schuler is the same guy that pastored, you guessed it, Donald Trump. I never wanted to leave a sermon when I heard him preach. I never, always made me feel so good. I had the wrong guy. That was Norman Vincent Peale. I'm pretty sure that was the wrong guy, but that's okay. Uh, so I stand corrected on that. I should put that in the video. I forgot about that. But anyway.
good. I never wanted to leave it. It was huge. It was great. It was wonderful. It was, it was, it was big. It's going to be big. That's deceive. Now, this guy was yoked up with Rome to the core. I mean, it's so obvious, his connections to Rome. And it's so obvious that apostate Christianity today can't take that. They can't take the fact that, look, the guy's shaking hands with the poop, okay? <laughs> and Billy is going to deceive, he's going to deceive more in his death than he did in his life. That's what's going to happen. They're going to let me ask you a question. How many independent, fundamental, fiery, Bible believing preachers, Baptist preachers, firebrands that preach the word of God unapologetically? How many of them are going to be how many of them are going to be part of a president's pastor, America's pastor? Really? That's America's pastor, a stinking wolf. That guy, the wolf. Yeah. That's America's pastor. It's America's apostate pastor, maybe. Because men love apostasy. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. I mean, think about it. Billy Graham, he was an apostate. Now, we can go fact by fact, and that's fine. You can go back and listen to it. I have it on my, on my wall, on my wall, <laughs> on my page, and everywhere else. I have it. Um, you know, and oh yeah, now, yeah, that's a side note that, that, that whore that was with Benny Hinn in Rome and got caught at the Vatican sleeping with Benny Hinn, Paula White is now his pastor, Trump's pastor. Anyway, but, uh, here's the thing. Billy Graham proved by his connections, by his the fact that he would not condemn Rome, he would not condemn the gospel that Rome preaches. He would not do any of those things. He proves that he was an apostate. His Billy Graham's meetings were filled with Roman Catholics. Billy Graham's meetings were filled with Jews, uh, Judaizers. Um, and I don't mean Hebrew roots people. I'm talking about actual, you know, rabbis would show up to those meetings. They would actually send people back they would actually send people back to their churches you know uh to their apostate churches he said that muslims and christians serve the same god that everybody comes to the body of christ in a different way why did he say that well because he doesn't believe the gospel he doesn't believe the narrow way but i heard billy preach back in the 40s and the 50s yeah and he was warned about his apostasy and he denied the faith you say but the billy graham association does a lot of good no you know i'm not going to stop what i'm doing i'm not going to stop preaching against billy graham and his stinking wicked heresies and his wicked false gospel that he preached anyway so that gives you an idea but here's another one that i did many years ago back in 2014 it has wow it has almost 4,000 downloads on sermon audio and if you listen to that one in this one i explain the apostasy of billy graham and i explain just exactly who he is his hand his jesuit handler excuse me, which is Jesuit handler is um, Bishop Fulton Sheen. I show the links, the false gospel, the filling of Billy Graham's meetings with, um, uh, with Jews, uh, lost Catholics, lost Jews, and they promised that they would not event, they would not proselyze the Roman Catholics. Okay. So, and the Jews. They sent them back to their synagogues. They sent them back to the Roman Catholic Church. So if you want to listen to that, you could listen to Prophets of the New Age Church that I did. That was many, many moons ago. That would have been, uh, let's see, eight years ago. Wow. Hard to believe eight years ago. It's been, been that long. But uh, it has been about eight years ago I warned about that. And... Uh, uh, so you can you can watch that one on sermonaudio.com slash Pastor Cooley. And uh, I, I should put those on uh, Rumble. And again, if you're just joining us here and there's like, I don't know, 50 people on here, 53 people, 
get over to Rumble, please, and subscribe. So when we go live on Rumble, we're going to switch our platform mainly over to Rumble that we can uh, get um, an audience built up there on on Rumble. So you can follow us easier on that. We'll have that on our plat on our uh, on our website. We'll have. Uh, Rumble, you know, and we're still going to use Sermon Audio as well, and we'll use YouTube until we get kicked off, but I just want you to see those things. Be mindful of that and subscribe over there uh, to that page. Now, anyway, so that's Billy Graham. That's the warning. So Billy Graham, the Jesuit coadjutor, who's Roman Catholic, uh, who's Roman Catholic handler, was Bishop Fulton Sheen who made Billy big. He was on a train and he promised Billy that you'll be the next big thing, Billy, if you follow us. There were men that warned him like John R. Rice and other fundamental Baptists that warned Billy not to go that way, but he didn't listen and he went that way and he became world famous and, you know, everybody loves Billy. But Rick Warren preaches the same gospel as Billy. Uh, And uh, we're going to finish up with this and then I'm going to show you at the end of this broadcast here today, which you have about an hour left or so, I'm going to show you at the end of the broadcast exactly how Rick Warren built these churches, how he did it, and ask you, does that sound like a biblical foundation? Does that sound like a church that you want to attend? Does that sound like a pastor that you would want to have? And why in the, and it's because he has so much money and he's pumped. You got 50 churches in Orange County. Guess what? or 90 churches, excuse me, in Orange County, guess what? You have a lot of money. So what's the Southern Baptist Convention doing? They don't care. They don't care. They're, they're, a lot of them are apostates. They don't really care if he's preaching a false Christ, a false gospel. They say, oh, this is our belief statement. This is what we believe. Yeah, but you don't believe that, and you don't hold to that. Because if you did, you wouldn't do what you're doing. You wouldn't make comments like that, and you wouldn't yoke with Rome. And you wouldn't yoke with all these others. Right? So here we go. Let's get back to it here. Here's my love letter to you. Because I really am grateful. If this is my last convention. Because of Southern Baptist polity, I was allowed to serve one church for life. That's not possible in most denominations. And get grew, and grew it to become the largest church in this convention. And grew it to become the largest church in this convention. That doesn't mean you're right. I want you to understand something. It doesn't mean you're right. There were fundamentalists that said the same thing. Jack Hiles and Jack Scop and all these other men. Well, they grew the largest Sunday school in North America. That doesn't mean they're right. That doesn't mean what you're doing is right. What does the Bible say? It isn't who built the biggest work. It's what the Bible says. It's what the Word of God says. Because Southern Baptists gave me a passion for evangelism and mission, we baptized... 56,631 new believers. Okay, let's just see if they're real believers. If they're actually following the scriptures. If they're believing what if they're believing what Rick is selling, then he counts believers as Roman Catholics. He counts believers as all these other men uh, that are preaching that, that that are false doctrine that are under false doctrine. Chrislam or whatever other garbage is out there. Those aren't believers. Those aren't biblical believers. And as a Southern Baptist church sent 26,869 members overseas to 197 nations. That is a scary thing that that man exported that garbage all over the world. But I'm going to show you, it sounds like a good, I mean, hippity hop. It sounds like a great speech. And it sounds like, praise the Lord, man, that's revival. That's the power of God. Well, let's just see what he actually believes before we see if, that, if those are biblical churches, if what he's doing is biblical. 
Because there are, there are churches that are not biblical churches. Because Southern Baptists taught me the value of a membership covenant. 78,157 members of our church signed our membership covenant after taking a four-hour membership class. Because Southern Baptists taught me to emphasize the priority of Bible study. We now have 9,173 home Bible studies in homes in 162 Southern California cities. Because Southern Baptists taught me the value of church planting. I already what Bible are they studying? What are they studying in the scriptures? Right? Think about that. What exactly, what exactly are they studying? It matters what you're studying. It matters what you're being taught. It matters if it's the word of God. It matters if it's the truth. Because if they're all learning a bunch of compromising lies and false doctrine, what good is it? It's worse. You ever tried to teach somebody who's been indoctrinated with absolute false doctrine and heresy? I already mentioned, we planted 90 in Orange County alone and literally thousands around the world. Because Southern Baptists taught me to honor and love the local church, I've had the privilege for 43 years of training 1.1 million pastors. 1.1 million pastors, he says he's trained. Well, when I look at the state of pastors in America and across the country, I believe it. Like, I don't even think he's lying. I don't even think he's lying. Like, I think he's telling the truth. I think, I think he has trained 1.1 million pastors. Right? I think he has. And that's why we're in such a mess. Because what exactly has he trained them? What exactly has he trained them in? What exactly has he taught them? I'm not sure it's the scriptures. Because I'm going to show you what Rick Warren has taught them. And then you're going to be like, wow. Well, Rick, you've done more damage than you have good. That, sorry, friends, that's more than all the seminaries put together. Well, that's not saying much because all the seminaries are the cemeteries. I wouldn't want to. Look, I'll be honest with you here. I'm going to say something to you that will probably, like, it's that guy. He's so mean. That guy right there. That guy. He's just mean right there. A little blacker beard there, though. Man, look how black that was. That guy right there, he's a mean guy. That guy's going to tell you, though, that I wouldn't give you a whole lot for the average, for, for the Southern Baptist seminaries men that they're producing. Secondly, I wouldn't give you a whole lot of credit for the independent fundamental Baptist cemeteries and the men they're producing, right? Not impressive. They're not impressive. They don't know their Bible and most of them can't preach at all. Most of them are too afraid to take a stand. Most of them have been indoctrinated in corporate Christianity. I owe you all so much. This is the manipulation part. I owe you all so much. But I did all these wonderful things, but I owe you, please. It's me that owes you. Please. It's me. It's me that owns, owes you so much. Even though I did all these things without all of you, it's me that owes you. So I sincerely say,
thank you, Southern Baptist, for shaping my life. And in you're never going to find another Baptist who agrees with you completely on everything. There are Baptist brothers here today who don't believe Jesus died for the whole world. But we imagine somehow get along with them. So as Western culture grows more dark, more evil, more secular, we have to decide, are we going to treat each other as allies or adversaries? Well, you are an adversary. Here's the thing. You are an adversary if you're representing a false doctrine. If you're representing heretical views concerning Christ, concerning the Bible, concerning the truth of the scriptures, if you're yoking with Rome, you are the enemy. If you're yoking with a false gospel, you are the enemy. There isn't any doubt about that. That that's exactly what you are. You are an enemy of the cross. Just because you say Jesus doesn't mean you're a friend of the Lord. Right? The Bible talks about Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Right? Well, the things that, that he's doing are counter. Right? He's the one that's promoting things that are contrary to the scriptures. Second, since this is the year 2022, that means we are 2,022 years from the birth of Christ. Now we know Christ started his ministry at 30 years of age. Luke tells us that, had a three and a half year ministry. Christ died in AD 33. He was resurrected in AD 33. He gave the great commission in AD 33. He sent the Holy Spirit and started the church in AD 33. That means 2033, just 11 years from today, is the 2000th anniversary of the Great Commission. I hope one of you, because I won't be here next year, will make a resolution that Baptists take the next 10 years to finish the task of the Great Commission in our generation before the 2000th anniversary of the church. Are we going to keep bickering over secondary issues? Or are we going to keep the main thing the main thing? We need to finish the... Are we going to bicker over that little command in the scriptures about, uh, I don't know, the pureness of the gospel, earnestly contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints? Are we going to bicker about that? Are we going to bicker about women being in the office of a bishop? Right? Are we going to bicker about that? Are we going to bicker about, about you know, I mean, husbands being the head of the home, uh, fathers being the head over their families? Are we going to bicker about little things like women taking the office of a bishop? About transgender, bisexuals, and every other group of fruits and nuts that want to come in and change uh, the order, destroy the foundations, right? Are we going to bicker about that? Yeah, I'm going to. I'm not in your little convention, but I'm going to bicker about it. I sure am. Right? I'm going to. I'm going to bicker about it. I'm going to do more than that. 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna preach the devil on all of you over it, and I'm gonna prove that what you're doing is wicked, and what you're doing is vile, and it's disgusting in God's eyes. All right, now, having heard that, let me get to here. Having heard that, now what we're gonna do is take a look at in a minute here. Let's. Let's take a little break for a second here. I'm going to play a song for you. We'll take a little break for a second just to get your brain a little reset here and uh, give you a break from Rick Warren's nuttiness. And then what we will do is I'm going to show you exactly how he built that church and all those churches. Right. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith Faith is the victory, faith. faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith, faith is the victory. Faith, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head with truth all gird about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. Faith, faith is the victory. Faith. Faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him who overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith, faith is the victory. Faith, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So, oh, there we go. Bring me a water. I just need one of them. There we go. Don't worry, you won't be on camera. Keep you off camera. All right. There we go. All right. Anyway, so we are going to continue on, and now we are going to talk about just exactly how Rick Warren built his churches. Well, how did he build them? Since he bragged about them all, um, we should know how in the world he built them. What does he believe? What has he taught on? Uh, let's see. Well, let's start here. We'll start here. All right. Southern Baptist pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church in California, one of the world's most influential men, has a grow growing and non-critical relationship with the Roman Catholic Church. In his popular book, The Purpose Driven Life, Warren quotes frequently from Catholic authors, including Mother Teresa, 
Henry Nowen, Brother Lawrence, a Carmelite monk, John McCain, Benedictine monk who believes that Christ is not limited to Jesus of Nazareth, but remains among us in the monastic leaders, the sick, the guests, and the poor, Madame Guyon, a Roman Catholic who taught that prayer does not involve thinking, and John of the Cross, who believe mountains and forests are God. Mother Teresa and Henry Nowen, who are quoted at least four times in The Purpose Driven Life, believe that men can be saved apart from a personal faith in Jesus Christ. When Mother Teresa died, her longtime friend and biographer, Naveen Chawla, said that he once asked her bluntly, do you convert? She replied, of course I convert. I convert you to be a better Hindu or a better Muslim or a better Protestant. Once you've found God, it's up to you to decide how to worship him. Mother Teresa touched other faiths. Right? Hmm. Henry Nowen said, Today I personally believe that while Jesus came to open the door to God's house, all human beings can walk through that door, whether they know about Jesus or not. Today I see it as my call to help every person claim his or her own way to God. How about this? Here's some miscellaneous statements by Rick Warren. I see absolutely zero reason in separating my fellowship from anybody. Rick Warren. That's what he said. And you know, growing up as a Protestant boy, I knew nothing about Catholics, but I started watching ETWN, the Catholic channel, and I said, well, I'm not as far apart from these guys as I thought I was, you know? Well, yeah, we do know. Because we know who you work for. The church in all its expressions, Catholic, Evangelical, Pentecostal, Protestant, many others, has 2.3 billion followers. See, who's he describing? The One World Church. In 2005, Warren made the following statement to the Anglican Communion Network. He said this, I don't agree with everything that Catholics do or Pentecostals do, but what binds us together is so much stronger than what divides us. I really do feel that these people are brothers and sisters in God's family. I am looking to build bridges with the Orthodox Church, looking to build bridges, looking to build bridges with the Catholic Church, with the Anglican Church, and say, what can we do together that we have been unable to do by ourselves? Wait a minute. Huh. In 2006, Rick Warren presented a church health award to a family of God Church, a Roman Catholic church in Tacloban, Philippines. Now, I want, to, I want to ask you a question. Would it be hard to build a church like this? Would it be hard to build 96 churches like this? No, it wouldn't. Why would it be? By the way, here's, here's uh, an archive from the internet that has been taken down from church leaders the Holy Family Catholic Community, which is known in it for its novel approaches to evangelization, is very proud to sponsor two very special purpose-driven events. Implementing a purpose-driven church, teaching a purpose-driven life message. There you go. Warren endorses Catholic evangelization. Rick Warren endorses Tom Peterson's 2000 book, Catholics Come Home, which promotes the program of bringing lapsed Catholics back into the arms of Rome. Warren's endorsement as follows reflects a frightful level of spiritual blindness, says David Cloud. He, Warren said this, the mission of Tom Peterson and Catholics Come Home to bring souls home to Jesus and the church is critically important during this challenging time in our history. I fully support this new evangelization project. Oh, boy. There you go. There you go. In truth, Catholic evangelization is not about bringing souls to Jesus. It's about bringing them to the bondage of a false gospel and a false Christ, says David Cloud. This is why the term evangelization is used rather than evangelism. This program sees Catholic baptism as salvation, and it is more about Mary than Jesus. 
I was at the North American Conference, says David Cloud, on Holy Spirit and World Evangelization in 1987 with media credentials when the Catholic Evangelization 2000 program was announced. The head of that program, Catholic priest Tom Forrest, headquartered in Rome, was the keynote speaker. He said that he was thankful for purgatory because it is essential for salvation. In his, in his book, Be Holy, which I purchased at the conference, he gave the following clear statement of Rome's false gospel of sacramentalism. He said this, and I quote, This river of the Holy Spirit in salvation began its flow with our baptism and then again with the grace of our confirmation. This was our first renewal in the Holy Spirit. These sacraments of initiation making us new creatures, new sons of God. The charismatic experience is not a second baptism, some new sacramental grace, but rather the renewing of those sacramental graces of baptism, confirmation, and priestly ordination that have already made the Holy Spirit present with us, said Tom Forrest. End quote. See the difference? Catholics come home says that Peter was the first pope and invites lapsed Catholics to return to the arms of Mother Rome. On page 17, we read, Over the years at Catholics Come Home, we've heard from some of the hundreds of thousands of people who have returned to the Catholic Church or be converted to the faith. Roman Catholic speaker at Saddleback Church. So, is it hard to build 90 churches like this? No. In 2010, one of the speakers of, of Saddleback Church's apologetics weekend was Peter Kreeft, a Roman Catholic apologist. Kreeft's book, 1996 book, Ecumenical Jihad, Ecumenism and the Culture War, is absolutely packed with heresy. Kreef thinks it is very likely that there is a hidden Christ in pagan religions so that Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, etc. will be saved through Christ by his grace even though they do not consciously know or worship Jesus Christ. Now listen to me. Listen to me very closely. They are, that is Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. That's the secret. It's the secret that the, that the Masons hold to. It's the secret, right? It's the capstone. It's the same thing as the capstone that the NIV teaches. It's the Antichrist. That's who they're talking about. They're not talking about the Jesus Christ of the Bible. They are talking about the Jesus Christ on the dollar bill, the false Christ that will come, right? That's who the secret is. Hang on. This is who the secret is. The capstone. The one that brings them all together. Not the chief cornerstone, which is Christ, but the capstone where all religions will come together under a new world order. Novus Ordo Seclorum, that's what it is. That's who it is. That's who it is. That's the Jesus they're looking for. That's the one that they're agreed upon. That's the hidden one. You want to know who it is? It's the mystery. I'll show you where it is. It's right here. Here it is right here. You want to know who it is? It's right here. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, only he who now letteth will be will only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. That's the mystery. That's the one. That's the mystery of iniquity. 
That's who they're talking about. When they speak of that, oh, there's a hidden Christ in all of their religions. Yeah, it's called the Antichrist. And he's the one that's going to merge them all together. He's the one that they're going to worship. In Romans chapter 13, he's the one that's worshiped. That's who it is. And that's who he's describing. And you've got to be aware of that. You've got to understand that. That's who he is. Kreeft worships the wafer of the Catholic Mass because it is Christ, page 162, and because God hides behind the appearance of a little wafer of bread. He thinks that God prefers to work through the intermediaries of Mary and the saints and that he wants us to pray through Mary and not only directly. Kreeft says the very same God we worship in Christ is the God of the Jews and the Muslims worship. No, it isn't. But that's that Antichrist that shall come. How about Warren's praise for the Pope? In April of 2014, Warren gave an exclusive interview with the Catholic television net channel in which he gave effusive praise to the Catholic Church and the Popes and called for unity with Rome. He praised the works of Catholic cont con contemplative saints such as St. John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, calling their books a great classic devotional work, completely ignoring the fact that they held to a false sacramental gospel and venerated Mary as the mother of God and the queen of heaven. Warren said that Saddleback uses Roman Catholic contemplative prayer methods such as the very dangerous centering prayer and, and Saddleback's spiritual director was trained by a Roman Catholic named Jean Vanier. Are you getting that? So Warren's got a bunch of wicked, satanic, right? A bunch of wicked, satanic, false, contemplative mysticism, phonies. That's what they're doing. That's what they're teaching. So Rick Warren knowingly has Roman Catholic men that were trained, that trained their spiritual director, a contemplative mystic, a witch, trained them. That's who it was. That's who trained his men. That's what they're practicing in this church. That's the technique that they're doing, that they're using. That's how they built their churches. In fact, Warren said that when he was writing the Purpose Driven Church, he would get up in the morning, light candles, and start writing. Ah. Oh. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense, doesn't it? Sure. It's a bunch of, it's a bunch of satanic drivel. See, again... Please listen to me. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to I'm going to put me in the wide shot. Here you go. All right. So I'm in the wide shot now. And I just want I want to talk to you for a minute here. Let's see. Right there. I think I'm in the wide shot. There we go. Now, I want you to understand something about this, to be clear. Now, listen to me. Stop being deceived. Stop being deceived by people that say the name of Jesus, say the name of Christ, 
say their church, say they're for God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the or God the Holy Ghost, and and God the Son. They say the name of Jesus. They write books about Jesus. They have churches. And then you completely ignore what they're teaching. What Rick Warren is teaching is Antichrist doctrine. And they do it unawares. They creep in unawares. That's what they do. You're looking for witches to come up and just totally tell you that they're casting spells on you and go, woo, and, and do all kinds of crazy stuff. That's not what they do. That's not how they respond. That's not how they act. This that you're seeing with Rick Warren, this is Antichrist. This is what you have to be aware of. This is the deception. This is what you have to understand. These are the real witches. And if you don't understand that, you're going to be deceived by them. I'm just going to tell you flat out, you're going to be deceived by them. Because deceiving is what they do best. They are deceptive to the core. He called Pope Francis our Pope and said for authenticity, humility, Pope Francis is the perfect example. He is doing everything right. Warren said that Saddleback recently received a delegation from the Vatican consisting of about 30 Catholic bishops to study the church's style of evangelization. Well, that doesn't sound like it's very hard to build a church on. When you're building it on Roman Catholics in one big tent, you, go, you get along with everybody except those that rebuke you and preach the devil out of you and tell you that what you're doing is false doctrine, it's heresy, it's false, it's, it's false teaching, it's, false, uh, it's, it's a false salvation, it's a false gospel that you're preaching, and it's accursed. Warren said, I fully support the Catholic Church's new evangelization, which is a program to regain lapsed Catholics to the false Catholic faith, which is centered around the veneration of Mary. When asked by EWTN's Raymond Arreo, what is keeping Christians apart from the unity that John Paul II and all the recent popes have called for? Warren replied this, I think we need to go back to the words of St. Augustine. In the essentials, we have unity. In non-essentials, we have liberty. In all things, we show charity. I think this is really true. I think as the world, particularly the Western culture, becomes more secular, more anti-Christian, it is really incumbent on all Christians of every brand and stripe that we join together on the things that we share in common. When I say, do you believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Do you believe that Jesus Christ rose? Do you believe that he died on the cross? Do you believe in hell and heaven? Do you believe the Bible is God's word? If you answer yes, then we are on the same team. We might not all agree on all the minors, but we are Christians. People don't realize how big the church really is. It's the largest organization on planet Earth. We don't have anything to apologize for. There are 600 million Buddhists in the world. There are 800 million Hindus in the world. There are about 1.5 million Muslims in the world. Billion Muslims in the world. But there are 2.3 billion Christians who would say, I believe Jesus is who he claimed to be, the Son of God. But he's lying. They don't believe any of those things. They don't believe the Bible is the word of God. Roman Catholics do not believe that the Bible is their only rule of faith and practice. They believe the traditions of men trump the Bible. They believe that Mary is the co-redemptress. Redemptrix. That's what they believe. Preaching at the Vatican Conference in, in November 2014, Warren was one of the featured speakers at a Vatican Conference on Marriage and Family. Other speakers included Pope Francis, Catholic bishops and priests, plus Mormons, Jews, and Muslims. The November 17th and 19th Conference at International Interreligious Colloquium on Complementary 
area of men and women featured about 30 speakers representing 14 religions. It was sponsored by the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity and other Catholic entities. Russell Moore, the head of the SBC's Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, the ERLC, who also attended the conference, said, I am willing to go anywhere when asked to bear witness of what we as evangelical Protestants believe about marriage and the gospel, especially in times in which marriage is culturally imperiled. Russell Moore, the sellout. So these people are yoking with Rome. Any religious leader that tips his hat to Rome, that kisses the pinky finger of the Pope, that goes over to the Vatican, that has an audience with the Pope, is saying... When he says our Pope, Rick Warren is saying that he is in submission to the Pope. It means he is working for the Pope. Because the Pope has two keys, he thinks. The spiritual and the temporal. And, the, and he, when he kisses the, the finger of the Pope, he is saying that he is under the Pope. That he is subservient to the Pope. And that's why he's wealthy. That's why he's famous. And that's not hard to build 90 churches on that, now is it? Let's see. How about another one? Let's give you another one. So you have the you have the Jesuit side. Then you will have then you will have the Masonic order, the Jewish Masonic Kab Kabbalistic order, right? Look at this. In June, this is back in 2006, David Cloud reports, in June, Rick Warren spoke at the Sinai Temple in Los Angeles and did not mention the name of Jesus one time. It's like Jesse Duplantis says, oh, synagogues ask me to come and preach all the time. Really? They don't ask me to come and preach. Rob Eshman, the editor of the Jewish Journal of Greater Los Angeles, observed, Warren managed to speak for the entire evening without once mentioning Jesus, a testament to his savvy message tailoring Jesus, man has a plan. The Jewish Journal of Great, Greater Los Angeles. No, it is a testament, says David Cloud, to his wretched compromise. For Warren not to mention the name of Jesus when preaching to Jews is inexcusable. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The congregates at the Sinai Temple did not need to hear about Rick Warren's seeker-sensitive philosophy and his organizational methods. They do not need to hear him brag about how many copies of his books he has sold or how much money he gives away. They need to hear that they are lost in their sins and will go to an eternal hell if they reject Jesus as the Messiah. Warren and other church growth gurus claim that it that have not changed the Christian they have not changed the Christian message only the methods. In fact, if Rick Warren preached the same message that the Apostle Paul preached, he would have the same response from the unbelieving Jews today that Paul had. I'm going to cover that tonight. When Paul preached to those Jews, what happened? When Paul preached to those Jews in Acts chapter 22, I'm covering that tonight. Paul's uh, in about, I don't know, three hours, if you want to watch live on Sermon Audio, uh, .com slash Pastor Cooley. If you go there, you can listen live. It's Actually, I might broadcast on YouTube tonight. I don't know. We'll see. Whatever's easiest. But anyway, uh, when you listen to Paul's sermon in Acts chapter 22, they tried to kill him. Paul's police-escorted sermon. Please protected sermon I'm going to preach on tonight in Acts 22. But Warren and the other, they, they claim one thing, but they do the other. They would, they, Rick Warren and these guys would ridicule Paul. 
For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they as they have the, of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sin always. For the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Rabbi Ron Wolfson, good name, of the Sinai Temple has been influenced by Warren's Purpose Driven Church book and has had personal discussions with Warren, and Warren told him his interest is in helping all houses of worship, not in converting Jews. Not interested in converting Jews. See that? They're absolutely not interested in it. Well, why is that? Why would they be? Let's see. How about another one here? What time is it here? Oh, we got some time. How about this one? This all shows you, all this information, what it's doing is showing you a history, a timeline of what we're looking at. Is, well, how did Rick Warren build his churches? How did that exactly happen? Right? Well, he brags about it. Well, let's see how he built them. What did he build them on? Is it on the sure foundation of Christ Jesus the Lord? Is it on the gospel? No, it's on an ecumenical mess of false doctrine, of heresy, of damnable heresy and compromise. That's how he did it. Right? The following statement by Southern Baptist Pastor Rick Warren is from the interview with Francis Rocha at Vatican City, November 26, 2014. We have far more in common than what divides us. When you talk about Pentecostals, Charismatics, Evangelists, Evangelicals, Fundamentalists, Catholics, Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, and on and on and on, they would all say, we believe in the Trinity, we believe in the Bible, we believe in the resurrection, we believe in salvation through Jesus Christ. These are big issues. Sometimes Protestants think that Catholics worship Mary like she is another god. That's not exactly Catholic doctrine. People say, well, that, well, that are the, what are all the saints about? What are you praying to these saints? And when you understand what they mean by what they are saying, there is a lot more commonality. Yeah. Now, there are still real differences, says Warren. There is no doubt about that. But the most important thing is if you love Jesus, we're on the same team. Which Jesus is that, Warren? Which one is that? The unity that I believe we will see realistically is not a structural unity, but a unity of mission. And so when it comes to the family, we are co-workers in the field for the protection of what we call the sanctity of life, the sanctity of sex, and the sanctity of marriage. It's not true because you've waffled on all those. Many times people have been beaten down for taking biblical stance and they start to feel, well, maybe I'm out here all by myself. No, you're not. The church is growing in Latin America. What church? He's speaking of the one world church. The church is growing in Africa. It's not growing in North America or Europe, but it's growing everywhere else. So maybe we have this idea that we're not as influential. But we are far more influential than people realize. David Cloud says, this is the description of a one-world church by the pastor of one of the largest congregations in the Southern Baptist Convention. Yet he doesn't understand the ABCs of the gospel, salvation in the church. He understands either Baptist doctrine nor Catholic doctrine. It's obvious that he doesn't care. Rick Warren represents every element that defines the building of one world church, contemporary music, worship, ecumenical social work, downplaying of doctrine, fuzzy doctrinal thinking, contemplative prayer, non judgmentalism, and treating critics as unchristian and dangerous, to, me to mention some of the few. Listen to what he says here. And I know that the picture went out, but that's okay. Um, the Immaculate Virgin preserved free from all stain of original sin, was taken up body and soul into heavenly glory. 
when her earthly life was over and exalted by the Lord as queen over all things, that she might be more fully conformed to her son, the Lord of Lords, and conquer of sin and death. That's the Vatican Council. That's Vatican II. Is that what Rick Warren believes? He sees misrepresented Roman Catholicism. They do believe as Mary as their, as their uh, co-redemptress. As St. Irenaeus says, she being obedient became the cause of salvation for herself and for the whole human race. Hence, not a few of the early fathers gladly assert with him in their preaching, death through Eve, life through Mary. This union of the mother with the son and the work of salvation is made manifest from the time of Christ's virginal conception up to his death. She cooperated in the work of the Savior in an altogether singular way to restore supernatural life to souls. As a result, she is our mother in the order of grace. Mary, sharing as she did even on Calvary, had a part even in the once-for-all acquisition of the great treasury. Now, from this common sharing of will and suffering between Christ and Mary, she merited treasury. Or she merited to become most worthily the repar reparatrix, however you say that. One who makes amends or atonement for a lost world, and therefore dispensatrix, one who dispenses of all gifts which Jesus gained for us by his death and his blood. That's Vatican II's documents. Do you realize what they're saying? Do you realize that? What they're alluding to? Mary has been once said this, taken up to heaven, she did not lay aside the saving office, but by her manifold intercession continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. By her maternal charity, she cares for the brethren of her son who still, who still journey on earth surrounded by dangers and difficulties until they are led into their blessed home. Therefore, the blessed virgin is invoked in the church under the titles of advocate, helper, benefitrix, and mediatrix. Well, well who's called the advocate? Oh, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Christ is our advocate, not Mary. Christ is our advocate. Christ is our redeemer. They call her mediatrix, but what does the Bible say? It says here, 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Christ is the Redeemer. Christ is the mediator. Right? Paul warned us, didn't he? He said, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled at Eve through his subtlety. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Paul is warning there is another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. That's the one Rick Warren believes. That's the one that Rick Warren is taught. That's the one that that's the, that this is the church that Rick Warren is describing is a one world church. Listen to what he said about fundamental Christians. Rick Warren of the Purpose Driven Life fame says that Christian fundamentalism will be one of the biggest enemies of the 21st century. He lumped Christian fundamentalism in with Muslim fundamentalism, secular fundamentalism. Thus, the Christian fundamentalist who merely seeks to take God's word seriously and to live it and to preach it faithfully before his heavenly master is as dangerous to this world as a Muslim terrorist or a radical atheist. Warren said that the Christian fundamentalism is motivated by fear. One of the many great problems with this statement is that the Bible often speaks of fear in a positive manner. Paul was afraid that the devil would deceive the believers through false gospels, false Christs, and false spirits. 
And we should therefore follow the apostles' example and fear spiritual deception both of ourselves and for others. The Bible says pastors who sin should be rebuked before all that others may fear. Would that Saddleback Church would take that verse seriously and rebuke their heresy preaching pastor publicly. Noah is commended because he feared at God's warning. Paul feared that that some of us would be taken, right? Some of us would be deceived, that some of his own people would be deceived, right? He feared that. He had good reason to fear that. You have good reason to fear that you could be deceived if you don't follow the scriptures, if you don't follow the Bible and you follow men's philosophies. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. That's right. Not after Christ. That's exactly what they're doing. I could go on and on. There's so much more that could be said about Rick Warren, about what he's teaching, about his heresy, about what he's built his churches on, but I think you can see what he's built his churches on. I think it's pretty clear that he built his churches on falsehoods, that he built his churches, he built his empire on yoking with Rome. That's what he built his work on. And now he sits around, he brags about it. He brags about what he's done. Right? All right, I'm going to set this camera up and then I'm going to give you an opportunity to say hi or if this is your first time listening or maybe you just want to say hi to us, you can do that on chat. I'm going to play this song and I'm going to fix the camera here real quick. As I travel through life with its trouble and strife, I've a glorious hope to give cheer on the way. Soon my toll will be o'er and I'll rest on that shore where the night has been turned into day. Up in the beautiful paradise valley by the side of the river of life. Up in the valley, the wonderful valley, we'll be free from all pain and all strife. There we shall live in the rose tinted garden, neath the shade of the evergreen, evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise, paradise valley, where the beauty of heaven, of heaven I'll see. As I roam the hillside, or I list to the tide, as I pluck the sweet flowers that grow in the dale, a faint picture is there of a land bright and fair, where perennial flowers ne'er fail. Up in, Up in the beautiful paradise valley, by the side of the river of life. Of life. Up, in Up in the valley, the wonderful valley, we'll be free from all pain and all, all strain and all strife. There we shall live in the rose tinted garden Neath the shade of the evergreen, evergreen tree How I long for the paradise valley, paradise valley Where the beauty of heaven, of heaven I'll see Though your garden is rare, it is not to compare With the flowers that bloom in the garden Above in the midst of it grows Sharon's perfect sweet rose Tis the wonderful flower we love Up in the beautiful paradise valley By the side of the river, the river of life Up in the valley, the wonderful valley We'll be free from all pain and all strain and all strife there we shall live in the rose-tinted garden Neath the shade of the evergreen, evergreen tree How I long for the paradise valley, paradise valley Where the beauty of heaven, of heaven I'll see All right. There. Amen. All right, everybody. I hope you're doing well. Uh, listen, ways to contact us. You can always go go to this Rumble page. Get an account on Rumble. We have 27 subscribers. So we've went up almost 20 today, which is good. But let, we got to get that up there. I got to get, I'm going to do a video maybe a little bit later on, a quick video. And uh, I'm going to put the link in the description for going to sub on our Rumble page. 
And I want to get as many people over there to that rumble as possible. We're, we're working on getting, uh, adding rest rumble to restream. And we're going to try to build that platform up. I believe that might be a good opportunity for us. So you can contact us there. You can contact us on sermonaudio.com slash Pastor Cooley. You can contact us here. Uh, and uh, you can find all of our sermons here. Uh, and everything that, you know, you'd like to find new things and listen to them. Um, and uh, all that good stuff. So anyway, uh, let's see. You can find us on Facebook. Uh, you can find me on my Facebook page. I've got three different Facebook pages, Jason Cooley, Jason Lee Cooley. And I also have Old Paz OPBC online. Uh, I have that one too as well, uh, which, um, yeah. So anyway, uh, also YouTube, you can find us on our YouTube page. If you'd like to, number one, pray for us. We need We need prayer. Pray for us. Uh, number two, if you'd like to support our ministry uh, and what we do here, uh, then please uh, subscribe or please, um, you know, uh, you can use YouTube or you can, or excuse me, you can use PayPal. I'm looking at the screen here. Listen to what people are saying or reading what people are saying, getting confused. Uh, you can PayPal us at salvationpreacher at gmail.com. You can, uh, or at pastorcooley at icloud.com. Uh, people use Apple Pay. There's people that use that WhatsApp or whatever that is, uh, something like that. There's a cash app that people have used. Uh, there's uh, Bitcoin, Coinbase stuff that people have used. All kinds of different things uh, to try to support the ministry and do whatever. Or you can do it the old-fashioned way. You can mail us something if you'd like. If you can't do any of those things, that's okay, too. You can pray for us, right? Uh, you can pray for us. So, and you should pray for us. Above everything else, you should pray for us because God will meet all of our needs all the time and he'll use anybody he wants to, to do that, amen? So, but prayer is uh, is God's way of meeting our needs. God uses people, he uses the prayers of his saints and he's blessed the prayers. So we appreciate that and all that good stuff. I appreciate all of you that have, supported us through number one, your prayers and number two, through giving. I really do appreciate uh, you doing that. And uh, if you never do, I'm still your friend. I, I it, it's fine. I don't, again, God takes care of us, but I am very grateful to all of you that uh, have sent things in to be a blessing to us. And I know some people can't afford to do anything and that's okay. Don't, don't, Look, we don't want anybody giving begrudgingly. The Bible says do it with a cheerful spirit. If you can't and you're not in a place to be able to do that, don't worry about it. Pray for us. Don't. It's not that big of a deal from that standpoint. God is greater than all things. Amen. But I appreciate you that have supported us and uh, you that pray for us and all those things. I'm very grateful for all of that. And uh, I try to bring you the truth, try to be a blessing to you and uh, try to get as much truth to, to arm the saints of God out there and to encourage those that are trying to stand for God wherever they are in the, in the country and in the world, wherever they are in the world, uh, all over the world, there's people that write me and talk to me. They're, you know, from Ireland, like today, Northern Ireland and, and Ireland and different places, and they're encouraged by what we do. They're encouraged to continue on in the faith and to stand firm in the faith and to, and to, to live the truth, and, and it, that's important to me that People are encouraged out there to continue to walk with God and that they don't, uh, they know that there's other people out there that are willing to take a stand. They're willing to uh, stand up in the hard, uh, in the hard situations and, and in the challenging situations of this life and, uh, you know, continue to serve the Lord. Uh, here's another thing that, that you all ought to think about too, as well as praying for us for this pride event that's coming the end of the month in June. The end of June, June 25th, Twin Cities Pride. There's going to be a lot of people there. It's going to be a big event. And there's a lot of big events coming that we're going to be preaching. Now, you have to understand something. We print up thousands of tracks. Oh, and another thing I want you to keep an eye, uh, just remember, and man, can you believe it's already, we're getting to that time. But we're, you know, we're halfway through June right now. Just remember, at the end of August and September, we have a huge evangelism push. 
August, September, October, you know, uh, we have a huge three months of evangelism. So just remember that there's a lot going on and we have a lot of tracks that we have to print or pay for. And it's the tune of a thousands, thousands of tracks have to go out. Uh, maybe anywhere from 15 to 30,000 tracks go out over the course of now until the end of the year. This is our big push this last six months. We do a lot because there's not a lot going on when it's freezing cold and people aren't, they, they canceled a lot of events because of COVID and all the other things. So, but now we push, we're going to be pushing forward with a lot of things coming up, a lot of a big summer events. And we want to get out there and preach those big summer events. And you pray for us, pray for our safety, pray for the Lord to bless our message, pray for uh, souls to be saved, lives to be changed, people to get right with God, saints to get right with God that are out there that hear the truth. You pray for us that God would protect our church, protect our families, protect our homes, give us the power of the Holy Ghost of God. And uh, that we would be in unity, one with another in the church at Old Paz Baptist Church, and that we would walk in truth, and that we would, you know, love one another with a pure heart fervently and, and do the work of the ministry. It's bigger than all of us, that souls would be saved and lives would be changed. Amen? So please uh, be in prayer for those things as we evangelize a lot. We're going to be in the face of a lot of evil and wickedness. It's, it's Satan's going to be... Uh, not going to be happy with what we're doing and he'll have his minions out there and, and, uh, they're going to be angry about what we're doing for the Lord. So you got to remember that and you got to be praying for us. We need your prayers. And, uh, you know, we appreciate that. And, and I, I hope that, uh, you remember to do that. All right, everybody, God bless you all. Hard to believe it's, it's been another, Another broadcast is done. I'll be back, Lord willing, on Friday, and I am looking forward to it, to being back with you on Friday. And maybe we'll do a Bible study. I don't know. This was really a lot of Bible study, really. I mean, we went through a lot of scriptures, and it wasn't a strict Bible study, though, but it's dealing with uh, taking and rebuking the lies of the devil with the Word of God, which is very important. Uh, you're very welcome, Mary. Uh, and I'm glad Carl let you out of the box so you could talk for a few minutes. That's good. That's always nice. Uh, that that happens. Uh, so anyway, but uh, God bless you all. And uh, you take care. And we will see you, Lord willing, back on here Friday real soon. God bless you all. Take care. You have a good night.